everyone. I'm uh, Boris Blesemer. I'm a lead JavaScript engineer at Lab Digital. Uh, I tend to uh, work on the full stack, but my proficiency is mostly in front end. So why would I give a GraphQL uh, talk? Well, I'm also really interested in having a performant backend because a performant backend means we also have a performant front end. Um, it's been a long day for you all, so I hope you uh, can all catch along and uh, I'll try to make it uh, all make sense for you. So I'm, I work at Lab Digital. And at Lab Digital, we provide composable commerce for multiple clients like Knives and Tools, Laumon, Phrases Group. Uh, some of them might say something to you, others might not. Um, so we've been doing this for a few years now. We've run into a lot of issues, we've fixed a lot of issues, and we have a pretty good idea on how to work with composable commerce. But um, So that's why also why the talk is going to be about highly scalable GraphQL for composable commerce. Um, before I actually start talking about it, um, I will first try to explain what composable commerce is. So composable commerce is actually e-commerce, um, but instead of building a completely your own uh, e-commerce web shop with something like a Magento or some other solution, we actually use a lot of different SaaS services. So you see in this example, we have something like Commerce Tools, Econeo, Stripe, PayPal, payment solutions. And we use a lot of these services to, to create one platform for our clients. Um, so composing these SaaS services actually comes under a flag or a name called MAG. Um, if you've already heard of this uh, term, then um, if you've already heard of it, then it might be quite clear already. You might get tired of it, um, actually. Uh, but actually means <laughs> it's also a really fast website, right, <laughs> that you build. Um, so it actually stands for microservices, API first, cloud native and headless. So it actually means that all of the services that we use are based on a microservices architecture. Um, for enabling that composability between services. Um, we, it's API first, so instead of having to work with all kinds of different ways of communicating between them, each of these services are based on API, so you can all communicate through that API. Um, all of those services are cloud native, which means that it should easily be scalable and flexible for any searches in, in, in visitors, or if you have something like a, a high value product, like a limited sneaker or something, you need to be able to scale up to hundreds of thousands of people trying to access your web shop. And the last thing is, uh, is headless. So you might have seen headless in a front-end context, like headless components, or it also means that there's no specific user interface to a component. It means that you have a bunch of APIs and you cre can create your own front-end, your own experience around those components. So there's actually quite a nice, I guess, business statement, more of an enterprise statement around it. Um, it means um, MAG technologies support a swappable enterprise tech stack in which every component is pluggable, scalable, replaceable, and can be continuously improved through agile development to meet evolving business requirements. It's, uh, it's quite a, uh, a mouthful, actually. Um, so we're going to focus on the whole swappable, pluggable, scalable, replaceable aspect of it. Uh, to give uh, kind of an example is uh, for one of our clients, we uh, had an e-commerce solution with a built-in promotion system. Um, it was a really nice promotion system. It, it kind of worked for them, but that specific part wasn't enough for them. They had really specific loyalty uh, uh, questions or they, they need to, needed to do something really specific with uh, promotions. So that part should be easily replaceable. And that's uh, kind of, yeah, it also aligns to the whole MAG statement uh, as well. So if we look at headless e-commerce, there's a lot of different kinds of services that you use. You have the headless e-commerce services itself, something like a commerce tools or a commerce layer or big commerce. And they offer you a bunch of APIs to do things like uh, fetch products or uh, add something to a cart for a user or be able to uh, uh, make a shopping list or go through a checkout. Um, if you're building a web shop, you also need a lot of content. So you'll use a headless CMS as well, something like Contentful, Content Stack or Storyblock. Um, I mean, it's also really important is if you're selling, trying to sell something, you need a payment system as well, right? Unless you want to give it away for free. It's also fine as a consumer, but I think as a website, you definitely need this. Also important is search and faceting. So solutions that allow you to search for products or uh, in faceting case, it means that if you have a product listing page, you might need to filter out specifically what kind of product that you need. And if you want to save any of your users or have accounts, then you need an authentication system. Something like an Alt0 or an AWS Cognito. Um, yeah, that's all used to save your order details or have any kind of uh, 
uh, user setup. But this is not all. It's actually quite a big picture to building a Mach uh, or composable commerce website. Um, and that also depends on the scale of your client. Some of the clients have things like campaigns, loyalty, uh, uh, specific promotion services, or all kinds of personalization and targeting to uh, um, yeah, build your commerce stack. Um, so there's a lot of uh, services involved to building uh, composable commerce. We're going to talk about the challenge of composing those SaaS providers for commerce. Um, and we're going to use an example for this. So one thing you might see quite often is you might have some, for, some form of a content page with a bunch of top products. Um, give a nice example over here. It's actually quite simple for one of our clients. Um, the content part is actually the popular title, um, but you can have all kinds of titles and then like a set amount of products that you want to show on a content page. And what's interesting about this is, is that not all of this information comes from one surface. I mean, the, the CMS title, the, the popular, might not come from the commerce system, but you need it from a CMS. So how would you actually achieve um, taking both commerce and CMS data? And there's a bunch of options for it. I'm going to go through four of them. Um, the first of them is uh, mixing and matching in the front end. So option one, mixing and matching APIs and SDKs in the front end. Um, if you do that, you might get something like this. This is a, a React server component where, in an ideal state, you fetch a bunch of content data uh, using the, the slug for a page or the path. Uh, and we also fetch the commerce information for that specific page with the content, for example. So you've got two fetches uh, and you build a content view. It's not too bad, right? You might have two calls of 100 milliseconds. It's doable, but is that data actually shaped to the needs of your front end? Or if you're trying to build something more complex, you'll end up with something like this, which is uh, quite a complex component. And just going through this, there's about four network requests happening and a lot of filtering and uh, restructuring of your data. So if I go through this component, then something a uh, typical page we, we've seen before is that you have to fetch the layout information, like header, footer, uh, and the page-specific information from a CMS. Um, based on that page CMS, you might have the categories. Uh, uh, you might have to fetch the categories. And once you actually have the categories for a page, then you need to fetch all the products, because um, one of those SaaS services might not have one call to do it all. So we're already at four network requests. And then we don't even have the data in the form that we want. So we're just doing a bunch of filtering, mapping, uh, restructuring all of our data in the front end. And what's really annoying about this is not just that if this is a client uh, component, then it's slow on the client. But if it's a server component, and you, uh, or it's a uh, component on the client and on the server, then it's slow on the server. But it's also slow when you're trying to hydrate it on the client. So you're just double dipping uh, in performance. So this is not actually great. So let's go to option two. Let's use one of those other SaaS providers to integrate all of the other providers. Um, this is something you might have seen before in the wild, but uh, what of often happens is something like a headless CMS, a contentful or content stack, might have the option to uh, integrate other services. They might have some kind of marketplace where um, they offer you to, oh, um, you have product information from Shopify or BigCommerce or Commerce Tools. Sure, we have an integration for that. We'll just take your data, you can integrate it, uh, and you have everything available on the CMS. You only have to fetch from the CMS and you have everything, which is great, right? One fetch. But then you end up with something like this, where if you look at the left side, um, the CMS is solely responsible for everything that goes to your commerce store. So if you were to take that CMS part and remove it, then you lose uh, access to everything on your site. So there's no more commerce, there's no more search, no more payments. Everything is be be behind that CMS layer. and You need to set up everything for some other CMS as well. And what we actually want is something on the right where um, each of these services have their own information. They all feed to your store and you're actually in control of um, uh, replacing something. Okay, this also not a great solution, then we can go to option three. We can use GraphQL schema stitching to merge those providers in the, in the back end. And what GraphQL schema stitching does is um, each of these SaaS providers might have a GraphQL API. Um, you take each of those APIs um, 
and you kind of stitch them together to one super API. Um, so, but that's actually quite involved. So if you take this example, we have a content GraphQL API, um, we have a commerce GraphQL API, um, and we want to stitch them together. But one of the issues that we have with GraphQL is uh, there's no namespacing. It's all one big uh, ball of types. So the first thing you might need to do, or you definitely need to do, is you need to rename those types, because um, every commerce GraphQL API has an image type. They all have their products or images. And the same for content. So both of them have an image type. So, okay, I'll need to prefix them. I'll have a commerce image, I'll have a content image. And then you go to the next step, and that's actually the business requiring you to remove certain fields, because if you query your product, you can get everything for it, like stock numbers. And I was talking about limited items, like, I don't know, limited sneakers or graphics cards a while ago. Um, you don't want to actually output your stock numbers to everyone or to your competitors, um, because they can do nasty tricks like making cards to take up other items, so nothing's available for uh, other visitors. Um, so, okay, we remove those fields, we do another modification, and then we actually want to do some extra things whenever you add something to a card, for example. Uh, think of doing some extra analytics. Um, so, whenever you add something to a card, you need to ping like a segment or a Google Analytics or something else to let uh, uh, your business users know, like, hey, someone's created a card and hasn't used it in a while. So, okay, we'll just build some custom resolvers, extend the types, do some magic, and we've got that working as well. But that means you now actually just own a complex layer of modifications that yeah, requires constant maintenance. You don't really own the schema, you're just doing changes. So, and it's also quite limited, because if any of those GraphQL APIs change, then all of your modifications might break. All of your services might completely just break down. And you can't actually do everything with it. You can't change inputs of fields uh, or of uh, queries, for example. So um, you're also limited in that aspect. So we've got three solutions, and none of these are swappable, pluggable, scalable, or replaceable. Um, they're all, yeah, they, they might be good at one thing, but they're not good at all of them, and that's not something we're looking for. So we actually think that GraphQL Federation is a great fit for composable commerce. Um, so, okay, cool, GraphQL Federation. What is GraphQL Federation, actually? And I'll try to make it make sense, but it's actually quite a complex topic, so uh, if you have any questions afterwards, please just ask. Um, so, GraphQL Federation actually exists of subgraphs. And subgraphs, um, uh, it, it sounds like just a graph, but they're actually a GraphQL server. So in this example, we have an account, products, content, and checkout. Each of them are their own complete GraphQL servers. You can create them individually. They have their own, they, they might be running in their own Docker container or Lambda function or something else, uh, or just by running node uh, index.js. Sorry, does that mean for endpoints? Yeah, for yeah, for GraphQL endpoints, uh, all running independently from, its, from each other. And then you have the super graph, and the super graph is actually what ties it all together. Um, so the super graph is, is uh, um, uh, the router that takes each of these graphs and merges them together. And then you have the router that actually knows what services to go to. So I've taken a really, really simple example of having a product subgraph where you have a title and a school of a product, and you have a content page type, which has the ID, title, and the path of a content page. Uh, each of these gets merged to one super graph, which is just putting them under each other, uh, concatting them together, and then you have uh, both in one graph. And then you have the router, and the router actually takes care of efficiently resolving your queries. So um, if your front end was to query both at the same time, then the router knows, okay, I need to query those parallel from each other. If I just need one of, one of these, it'll just query the products or the content. Um, So, how would this actually work with Composable Commerce? Um, so, in this example, I'm going to build a products and a content service, something we own ourselves, uh, and not focus on account and checkout, because we want to actually build that top products block. So, first of all, we're going to set up the subgraph for the product, uh, product service. And the way we'd like to work with GraphQL is schema first. So, we first want to model how we want um, to work with our data, 
Um, so we're first going to think about, okay, what should a product look like? And also, this is a very simple example. If you take a real e-commerce product, that will have tons and tons of attributes and other kinds of fields or specified pricing and multiple currencies and all kinds of challenges in that space. But in this case, we have a, an int for a price and we have a name and a SKU, and that's fine. And we also have two queries. Um, the first query is the products query. It has no arguments and it returns all of the products. Um, also, not production ready. <laughs> Please don't use this in a real production site. Uh, use pagination or something else. Um, and you can also query a specific product using the ID um, as input, as an argument. And it returns a single product. So we've actually modeled our data so we know how it's going to look like, but what we don't know is, is how are we going to fetch this data? Um, so this is a really simple example. Um, so we have two queries, we have the product and products. The first one actually fetches a single product by ID. Um, so we've, somewhere in the background, we've already built a complete context loader that loads the product. It's just an API that uh, fetches it from a, a commerce tools or another service. Um, and it uses the ID argument which is uh, what we've set up in our type definitions. And the other one just does a load all with no arguments because there's nothing needed. We just want all of the products. So, okay, we've got products set up. Let's also set up the content subgraph as well. So, we kind of do the same. What's interesting here is we've got a content page type which sets the path and the title. And then we've got the top products block. This is actually in the, the block that we want in the page. And what we actually do here is we have the title string and we have a list of product IDs um, because that's all the information that we have in the CMS. We have the IDs that we want to show uh, and we can, yeah, we use that as a, a output. And then we have to query to get a single content page by the path. And this returns the content page, including the top products block. So we also set up the resolver for this. It's pretty much the same as a single product resolver. We have a content page query uh, and we can load the content based on the path argument. Um, we'll not stay too long on this one. It's pretty much the same as products. Um, and then we have the router, uh, or the rug, if you have watched Big Lebowski. This is the router that ties it all together. And the router is actually really simple. It's actually kind of, I don't know, it's a few lines and then you've got a router running. The only thing it does is it, it needs to know about the services that you run and the name of it. So in this case, you've got products and content and it needs to know the URL uh, for it to reach those ind independent services. It doesn't need to know anything in background information. It just needs to know like, hey, what's the endpoint that I can use to query the schema? Uh, so what's really interesting about this is, is that that means that both those services run in their own containers, run in their, have their own endpoints, can scale independently, and their public-facing endpoint, or might make it internal, uh, is being used uh, for the router to fetch the information. So, okay, you now have one endpoint to query and introspect. You don't need to have multiple uh, endpoints uh, to work with anymore. Um, you have com complete control over your schema. You don't need to do any random modification anymore. If your schema isn't good enough, you make it better, right? Because you own it. Um, and each of those subgraphs is easily swappable. You can add in another product surface uh, as long as the schema stays the same. Um, I mean, it's much better, but it's not perfect yet. We still have some, uh, some problems left. So uh, if you go back to the front end, and we actually try to use this, it's actually not much better. <laughs> We're still running into the same issues. I mean, we've set up uh, a content page query. Uh, we set up a product query. So if we go through this component again, then first of all, um, we try to fetch the content, first of all. Then we know that inside the content, there might be a, a products block, and that products block might have a bunch of product IDs. So, okay, we've, we get those product IDs and then we start fetching all of those products uh, independently from each other. Um, so this is actually even more network request than the example I gave before. Um, and then afterwards, we do some, some, some crazy uh, mapping again to replace uh, the slugs with the actual products. So, okay, it's, um, I mean, it's all swappable and pluggable.
There we go. Oh, I spoiled it already. <laughs> so what is, what is the solution to, to, to move away from this complex React component to actually have a performance front end? Uh, let's bring on entities. And entities is something federation specific. It's, uh, it can be really complex. I'll uh, try to take you through it and, and uh, try to make it make sense for our use case. So entities are types that can be resolved across multiple subgraphs. Uh, yeah, don't worry. This does, might not make sense. I will explain it. So if we take the example of the product type definitions again, we have a product type. We have all the information available for a product. And we also know that, um, I kind of graded out, but we kind of know that the, the ID is enough for us to fetch a product. So what we do is we use a directive called key um, to let Graphical Federation know like, that the ID is all we need to fetch the rest of the data. And then we go back to our content type definitions. And here we have the top products block. And we know that um, we want to show a bunch of products instead of a bunch of product IDs. Uh, we don't know anything about the product. Um, you might have a separate team for content, and that team knows nothing about products except that it has IDs. So we set up the exact, exact same type. We also give it an ID key, and we, also, and we just give it the ID uh, string field, because we don't want to know anything else about the product. We have the IDs. Um, the products team can make up the rest. So if we move back to the supergraph that merges all together, the supergraph now knows that there are multiple surfaces, the content and the product surfaces, that know about the products type. And it looks at both those implementations. It's like, OK, a, a product uh, can be ha has an ID, SKU, name, path, and price. But internally, it knows that only the products subgraph knows the rest of the product. So if we go back to the resolver, um, we can actually build a function called uh, resolve reference. And what this function does is um, we kind of tell the server that um, if you give us an ID, I will use this logic to fetch the rest of the data. And since the content uh, subgraph actually has that ID available, we just have that information. Uh, the supergraph will go to product and ask, like, hey, um, can you give me the rest of the information? So for each product that's available, the router will then go to the product subgraph and use the resolve references to resolve the rest of the fields. So each of those products with just the ID will get the complete information. And what this actually means is that you'll get a query like this, just one single query. Um, because the supergraph is just products with all the fields available, you in the front end, you can just ask everything about a product. You don't need to first ask the content page and then do the product. It's all being done by federation. And then you get something like this, which is pretty much our end game of having a good React component. And now for something completely different. Let's drop the whole entity story. We've got our one query in our component. There's still another part of trying to get this top products block working. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've got a GraphQL schema set up. We've got our API. We've got uh, the front end kind of ready with our fake React component. But we still need to model that top products block in our CMS. We have our headless SaaS CMS somewhere, uh, and we need to set up uh, the complete model of a top products block. We need to make sure that we have the title. We need to make sure that you have the IDs. And there's a few ways you can do this. Um, you could go to their UI. You could click something together. Uh, or you could use their API and upload some JSON to, to model it. Uh, but then there's always the possibility of um, that CMS having a different model than your schema. So all you actually need is your schema to build this. Um, so we, we use our schema to define what the CMS needs to know. And how we actually do this, um, we do it with GraphQL CodeGen. If you've um, heard of it before, you might have used it to uh, generate code based on your GraphQL schema, something like TypeScript types, or even complete hooks for you to fetch your data. Um, we actually use it for that and some different things as well. But what's really interesting is we use it to uh, output it to infrastructure as code, um, which is also quite a mouthful. But 
Um, to give a kind of an introduction to it is that with infrastructure as code, you kind of define, for example, how you want your cloud services to be. Uh, say you have an AWS and you want to set up a server, you want to set up a CDN. Uh, with infrastructure as code, with a solution like a Terraform, um, you just define like, hey, I want my cloud to look like this. I want th this kind of servers. I want it to be able to scale up to five servers. So you kind of define your end state. And that solution of defining your end state is also perfect for setting up SaaS services as well. So, so we use something like Terraform to tell the CMS, like, hey, we've got a, a content page. It has this name. It has uh, a certain path, or it has uh, a bunch of fields available. Uh, we have a CMS block, and we can kind of model it that way. Um, so how do we actually do this? Well, we have a lot of information available in our scheme already. Uh, we already know the fields that we need to use uh, for the CMS. So we, need, we know that title is a string, and we know that uh, products have ID, um, and the complete page also has a title. Um, but it might not be enough for a specific CMS. Like some CMSs need to know like what, what's a content page. So we use a custom directive, um, and we have multiple ones for, for different CMSs. In this case, it's really generic. Um, but for example, we can use it to tell uh, the CMS that, hey, um, content page is actually a page. Uh, or a product is a, some kind of a document uh, that we want to save and reuse. Or the top products block is, is a CMS block, which is also something you might see more often where you have multiple blocks under each other. So based on all, everything that we've set up, we have an updated schema. And if we deploy um, everything, um, then we do a few steps to get this to the CMS. So first of all, we use uh, a GraphQL code gen um, to generate the code. So we take the GraphQL schema, we do the generation, we get the infrastructure as code. Um, with solutions like a Terraform, it actually checks like, hey, is there, has something been changed? Do we need to update the CMS or can we just ignore it and it's fine? Uh, so it does the check and we might have changed the field somewhere. Um, so once that check is done, it will push updates to your CMS. And, and all of this means that um, you have one GraphQL schema and you know that your CMS always aligns to it, unless there's some user that has too many writes and just starts clicking and editing, that might happen. Uh, please make sure they can't. Um, and then you have everything uh, on your GraphQL schema. Um, and we've already done this before for multiple CMSs. Uh, we've got two examples here, MP and the Storybook. If you're interested in this, we've got a, a, our github.com slash labd. We've set up um, the GraphQL code and plugins for, for MP and for Storyblock. We've also set up uh, a Terraform providers for you to push it to the CMS and even API clients for Golang if you want to do some more specific things. But uh, we've got all the tools available if you want to use any of these CMSs to uh, do the exact same yourself. And it's all open source, so uh, don't worry about license. Um, so, okay. What we've actually built now is completely swappable, pluggable, scalable, and replaceable. I mean, you can scale up each of these services. I mean, if you only hit your CMS once with your products a lot, then you might be able to scale up the independent product services. And each of these are replaceable as long um, as, long as the subgraph stays the exact same. And what's also cool, of course, is that we have this super graph and it defines the complete composition from what you use in the front end, uh, what your API looks like, and also what all of these external SaaS providers uh, uh, are models at. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my talk. If you have any questions, uh, uh, please let me know. And also, if this stands. Yeah, so, so one of the things about, uh, uh, so first of all, for everyone else, the, the question is about what if you use something else than a GraphQL API? How do you use federation then? Um, so what we do with federation instead of like a schema stitching is we built a GraphQL schema ourselves. And I didn't show it too much in depth, but um, the way we do it is we don't use the GraphQL APIs of those services anymore. We just use their SDKs. We, um, 
Yeah, so we just use the SDKs within our subgraphs to actually fetch the data that we need. So um, we have some services that ha only have a REST API. Um, we used to build our own whole GraphQL API behind it, but these days we uh, just build like a content schema. And then that content schema, you might use an SDK for commerce tools or for uh, some other CMS. Can um. you explore the mess? Because in, in the mess, I have to do this heterogeneous uh, services together and make a GraphQL gateway like you showed. Sorry, what's... Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that kind of comes to what we do with, with uh, graphical stitching of things that we've run into is that you're always kind of limited in a way to how their REST API works. Um, so, and you still want to completely design your own schema uh, if you want it to be as stable uh, as possible. Just fetch the data you want, combine it, you can still write your schema. This is what I'm used to. Am I, what am I doing wrong? So, so you're building one, one super surface that just has yeah, all the like queries BFF, that you have. Like a BFF, I've seen it multiple times. Make people write a BFF, they write, write one GraphQL uh, gateway, just run one GraphQL API, which, which uh, uses other APIs, sometimes REST API, sometimes REST API. You, you don't use the fancy stuff, you don't use federation, you don't use uh, GraphQL stitching. You yep. can still write your resolvers, combine the data yourself, and write a schema for it. What's so wrong with that? One? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so there's nothing wrong with that approach, um, but it doesn't really align to the, the whole composable uh, uh, approach that we use for our clients as well. So if we're looking at, at bigger clients, then they might have completely different teams that work on one part of the stack. So if you have one GraphQL server, then they all need to mix and match and, and, and work on that same GraphQL server. And now we're just saying like, okay, we have a content team. The content want, uh, team wants to show the products, um, but they're not in charge of the product, so, so we'll just uh, um, tell them like, okay, you can show the products here, but we're not going to tell how it should look. Oh, yeah. Across clients? Okay. No, no, but within a client, you might have multiple domain teams, yeah. for example. Okay. So, and then, then this uh, uh, works to the scalable approach. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, like, if you have just one client, for example, you write a BFF for them, then you would not go quickly to maybe the federation or stitching approach. Well, you just write the BFF for one client and you're done. Yeah, then, then, then you're done, uh, definitely. But uh, uh, um, yeah, most of the clients that we work with, we definitely have the, that MAG approach. Uh, and we need to be able to replace something in the complete subgraph if we want to. Okay. Nice. Yeah. You just do this with Apollo? Or is there like another service you use for the Federation? Or uh, there's multiple services to use. I think the, the most obvious one is Apollo. Um, um, it has uh, the gateway and the router. Uh, one of the issues you might have with Apollo is that um, their licensing has changed to be more uh, less open source, more business minded, so not all your clients might be able to use it. Um, there's, at least for gateways, there's multiple solutions. You have uh, Apollo, of course. Uh, you also have uh, from um, the GraphQL, uh, I think it's called the Hive or something, it's also a, a gateway solution, which is completely open source. And uh, uh, Wondergraph, I think, also has a solution for this. I know their schema registry, but uh, not their gateway. All right? Any other questions? Um, if not, nobody, nobody else, I just want to go again. Any real downsides? You, for, for, because the federation stuff, it looks you know, quite complicated. So I was just wondering. It, it, is, it is very complicated. I think that's a big downside. Yeah. Uh, another one I didn't talk about is, is if you take this and you put it, push it to production and somebody changes something somewhere, then everything will break. If your schema doesn't align anymore or the product type changes, then it'll still, uh, everything will still break. And, and what's actually the missing key in, in going to production is, is using a schema registry. Something like Apollo Graph OS or uh, Wundergraph Cosmo. And well, I haven't talked too much about it. What it actually does is it, it, it's a registry for your schema. It takes your super graph. And if any surface tr tries to change something that might break, uh, you can use checks, you can uh, make pull request fail, CI checks or something else to uh, uh, kind of protect your schema, protect your front end. Because if you've used GraphQL a bunch, then you know that if you change a field, 
the front end and the back end doesn't align anymore, you'll just get a big fat error on your screen. Uh, it's a kind of all or, all or nothing yeah, in that approach. So um, it is more complex and, and you need a bunch of extra services to be sure that everything stays working the way you want it to. All right, that's, uh, I guess that is for the questions. Uh, yeah, thanks for, for watching. And uh, yeah, if there are any more questions, I'm still at the stand. And uh, um, I'll find yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.